So what they are saying here is the same idea that we do with the piece. A piece of cardboard, 30 centimeters long and 25 centimeters wide. So we start with that, we can draw that out. We start with 30 here and 25 here. This is on page 58. And you have space at the top to add to this. And then you're going to cut out squares out of the corners. And since we don't know how big the square is going to be, we're going to call it X. Now when you fold this together, can you see that this is the shape that it would make? And that the height is your X. How long is the length now? Right? So I'm going to draw, if I draw this line here in blue, that represents this section in blue. And I'm going to draw this line in purple. Can you see that that represents that line there? These are the purple lines. Those would be the blue lines. How long is that blue line? 30 minus 2x, because you took an x off here. And you took an X off there. How long is the purple line? Same idea. 25 minus 2X. And since we know that the volume is length times width times height, this question says write a polynomial function to represent the volume in terms of X. So volume equals length, 25 minus 2X times width, 30 minus 2x, times height, x. Can you see that this is in factored form? Can you see that this is an x cubed graph? Because we have an x in one factor, an x in the other factor, and x in the other factor. If you multiplied it out, you actually would get 4x cubed. You see that when you multiply the x times the minus 2x times the other minus 2x, you would get plus 4x cubed. If we wanted to graph this using the techniques that you learned the other class, when we go to graph something, we are going to use the x-intercept, which, if you set the volume equal to zero, to find your x-intercepts, it's already factored. You get three x-intercepts. x equals zero, x equals 12.5, and x equals 15. We can draw those. and 15. An x cubed graph is an odd graph. Its end behavior is going to act like a line. So because we know it's a positive x cubed graph, we know that its end behavior will act like a line. So now when we go to graph this, we know that it starts down here and ends up here. The multiplicity of each of these, the exponent with each of these, each of these happens once. That means the multiplicity is 1. With a multiplicity of 1, your graph will always just go straight through those x intercepts. So from the videos of the other class, a multiplicity of 2 bounces off the x-axis. A multiplicity of 3 goes through but bends as it goes through. So even numbers bounce off and odd numbers go through. But if the odd number is bigger than 1, it bends as it goes through. 
These ones all have an exponent of 1. So they would all just go straight through. And there we have our graph. Now, that's the entire graph of this. One of the things that's going to happen in word problems is they're going to say, what is the domain? Now, the domain of an x cubed graph is everything. But when you deal with a real life situation, okay, some of these things don't make sense. Like, oh, could you cut out a square of negative 5? No, that doesn't make sense. Some numbers don't make sense. Can you cut out a square of 20? No, because if I cut out a square of 20, I don't have any room left on the other side for a square of 20. So in this question, <coughs> the smallest you could cut out is something just bigger than zero. The biggest you could cut out would be something just a little bit smaller than half 12.5. So you still have something left. In fact, in the graph, can you see that this section from 0 to 12.5 is the only section that makes sense? So, we've graphed the function. What is the domain? Your x value needs to be between 0 and 12.5. So that yellow section is the only section that makes sense. And somewhere in that yellow section, there's a maximum. And this is where you're going to either need a graphing calculator or Desmos to find this. So what we're going to do, if you have a graphing calculator, we're going to type in this equation. If you have Desmos, we're going to type in this equation. So I'll pull up my calculator. And once we've got that in there, we need to find out what that point is that gives us our maximum. So if you've got Desmos, type in this equation. If you've got a graphing calculator, type in that equation. And see if you can find this maximum point. Now, if you have a graphing calculator and you hit graph, you might not see this yellow section as nicely as you would like. In Desmos, you can like kind of zoom in and out easily. Sometimes with the graphing calculator, it doesn't zoom in or out very nice. In fact, probably most of you, if you did it on the graphing calculator, you probably started on the standard window and your graph just looks like a straight line. And you're like, hmm. What we want to see is the graph that we produced. We drew a sketch of the graph. We know what it looks like. But right now, we seem to only be seeing this little tiny bit of the line and not anything more. So we have to change things. Okay? Some things that you might you know, intuitively make sense to change, you might hit the zoom button. And you'd be like, oh, I could zoom out. Maybe that would help. Sometimes, though, when you hit the zoom out button, and push enter. Well, it looks like I've got a little bit of this and a little bit of this, but it's really squished and tighter together. So how do I change my window to see what I want to see? Well, there is a window button. Okay? 
That window button is going to be helpful on your graphing calculator. There's also a table button above graph. So we already know, and this is why it's really important to be able to sketch something without a calculator, we already know that the domain only makes sense between 0 and 12.5. So if I look at some of the numbers on the table of values between 0 and 12.5, can you see that like it's getting up to 1,500 and then it's coming back down? That makes sense that it would be getting bigger and then coming back down. So if I hit my window button, my window button lets me decide what I want to see. Right now, my window is looking from minus 40 to 40. And that's not really, I just want to see from 0 to 12.5. So maybe I'll go here and say minus 1 to 15. Because then I'll see this amount. And for my y values, I don't need to see a bunch in the negatives. So maybe I'll just use minus 1 there as well. But I saw that I needed to go up to at least 1,500. So maybe I'll put 1,600 in. And if I hit graph now, I really see this yellow section nicely. But I had to know something about my graph in order to do that. I had to know the domain from thinking about the question, and then I could use the table to see how big the values get. Now I want to find this maximum. On your graphing calculator, on, on decimals, I think you just click on it. It's really nice, click, found it. On the graphing calculator, you have to calculate it by going second, calculate number four, the maximum. Go to the left side of it, push enter, go to the right side of it, push enter, it asks you to guess, I think it's going to be there, push enter, and did you get 4.53 and 1,512 on your decimals? Perfect. So we got 4.53, does it say to the nearest nearest tenth, so this will be 4.5, 1,512. That is our maximum. The y value is the maximum the volume will ever get. The x value is the x value that will give you that. So if 4.5 is the x value, can you see that your dimensions would be, and maybe I'll use a couple more decimal places for my map, 4.5268, right? Would be 4.5 centimeters. The width, if I would do, The width is 25, and I'll do it on my calculator here, real quick, 25 minus 4.52 twice, which I, will be 20.5 centimeters, and the height, or not the height, the length, would be 30 minus 2 times, oh, shoot, screwed up on the math, that's stupid. You see what I forgot? I forgot the 2 times on the last one, I believe it was 25 minus 2 times 4.52. So I should get, well, it still rounds to 21 and 6 feet. This will be 2 centimeters. And 21 centimeters. And those will be the dimensions to give us the maximum volume. So we've got the dimensions of the box. What size of square needs to be cut out? That 
the same as the height. It's the 4.5 centimeters by 4.5 centimeters. We did ask for the max volume. We need to make sure we have our units there. 1,512 centimeters cubed. Actually a very useful problem because you have a certain amount of material, you want to make a box with it. If you were shipping stuff with that box, you can make either a big box or a small box. And it depends what you cut out. So it could be something very useful for someone managing a, quest, uh, managing a business or something like that. Okay. Um, Here's a question from an old exam. So I'm going to get you to turn to uh, page 56. I think there's a blank page on page 56. Yes. This is a little bit of a mean question when it came up on the exam because of how it was marked. The question itself is a fair question, but how it was marked I think was unfair at the time. This is on a non-calculator part of an exam. So write down the question on page 56, and then we'll talk about what was expected on the exam and why maybe the marking at that time was unfair to students. Okay, so does the picture make sense, what I've drawn with this question? And it says, first thing, write a function, volume of x equals, well that would just be length times width times height, so we'd have x plus 2 times x plus 10 times x. That was worth one mark on this question. This question, when it was given, was out of five marks. Okay. Then it says, find all possible values of x, given that the volume is 96. So we're given the volume is 96. We can take this equation and replace the volume with 96. And that was worth a second mark. So, so far, this seems very generous. 
right? The question seems fair, seems generous. And since it was non-calculated, sorry, that 10 looks terrible. Since it was non-calculated, the next thing students just started doing is they're like, well, I'm going to try some numbers. Because it's non-calculated, it can't be a super hard number, right? Does one work? One times 11 times three gives me 33. What about two? Two times four, eight times 12, 96. X equals two. And then they got two and a half out of five. That is the right answer. Two is the right answer. But they only gave students two and a half out of five because they're saying, how do you know that that's the only answer that works? How do you know that there's not more answers? So in mathematics, if we want to show something works, we really need to solve for it algebraically. Even though guessing and checking gives us the answer for this. So to solve this algebraically, and what was an argument that teachers said on the exam is that they maybe should have added the word in here, algebraic. So when I give you this question on your test, in in with different numbers, I'll add the word algebraically so that you know that you have to do the following steps. Okay? So if we want to solve this algebraically, we need to solve for x. Factoring is nice, but only when one side is equal to 0. And it's equal to 96. So instead, what we need to do is we need to multiply this all out. In multiplying this all out, choose two of them to multiply first. Should I multiply the x by 3? I get x squared plus 12x plus 20. Then I multiply it all by x. x cubed plus 12x squared plus 20x. And now I can move the 96 over. To make it equal to 0. And the reason this question was on the exam is they wanted to connect the factoring from parts one and two of this unit with the modeling and graphing questions at the end. So now how do you solve an x cubed graph like this? If you want to factor it, you're going to have to use your factor theorem, remainder theorem, synthetic division. Now, if we do this, let p of x equal this whole thing. What did we find out already? We already figured out that 2 worked, right? So let's just check. If I plug in 2, that's going to give me 8 plus 2 squared is 4 times that 48 plus 40 minus 96. Sure enough, that equals 0. Tells us that x minus 2 is a factor. If I want to write my division statement, I can use synthetic division. Dividing by x minus 2 would put a positive 2 out in front. Bring down the 1. Multiply. Add. Multiply. Add. Multiply. Add. Sure enough, I get it equal to 0. What, is this, what does the division statement do? It's factoring p of x. So now I can write x minus 2, and I'm left with x squared plus 14x plus 48 from my synthetic division. And then Sometimes the last one can be factored. Sometimes you're going to have to use the quadratic formula. 
So be careful for that. If it can be factored, you have to use the quadratic formula. In this case, it will be x and x, 8 and 6. And so we get possible answers are not just 2, but also negative 8 and negative 6. However, if we think about the picture that we drew, you can't have a height of negative 8 or a height of negative 6. Those two are not possible. So what we had figured out originally when we got 2 was correct to be the only answer. But this shows that other possibilities might have been there, but they don't make sense. So finally, we can now write out, did the question ask for the dimension? Is it in centimeters? Yes. Two centimeters by four centimeters by 12 centimeters. And unless you showed the synthetic division and the factoring, then they only give you either two out of five or two and a half out of five, which I thought was, and a lot of teachers thought, that's extra harsh. You got the right answer. It didn't say in the question, that you had to solve it algebraically. The argument from the committee is, well, if it says solve, you need to solve for everything. Just guessing and checking doesn't guarantee that there's not other answers. So the student has them shown. So the compromise on future exams was there like, well, then we'll be extra clear. We'll say algebraically. And then if you use guess and check, then you're going to be in trouble because the question was, specific in saying that, and that was a, an agreement that that would make it more fair for students. So you're going to get one like this on your test. Okay, and it's going to say algebraically. So once you've got the equation, you have to multiply it out, make it equal to zero, and then refactor it to solve. I think, I think the one that I gave you think on your test that needs the quadratic formula. Think. So just don't be scared if you can't factor. Okay? Am I being too nice? I should try to be. Okay. So I find that in this chapter, this maximum minimum, this application of what we're doing is actually would be very useful for someone in business. You're always trying to find maximum value. For those of you taking calculus the next year, you're going to find that a whole set of calculus is about finding maximums and minimums. Okay? Now, sometimes textbooks, or in this video here, 